All right, good day, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. First, I want to thank you for attending this webinar. We have an excellent lineup today um, for this presentation. I'm Bill Mahoney. I'm the director of the Research Applications Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And we have a great lineup of speakers to discuss this very important topic for the atmospheric science community and operational community. Um, uh, we have Dr. Jotheram Vivekanadan, a senior scientist at the Earth Observing Laboratory at NCAR. We have Dr. Jordan Girth, a physical scientist at uh, the NOAA National Weather Service Office of Observations. We have uh, David Lubar, a senior project manager for civil spectrum management at the Aerospace Corporation, and Rene Leduc, founder and principal at the Narain Strategy. Um, I'll remind everyone that we do have a, a Slido link for you to pose questions uh, during this event. After all the speakers have made their presentations, we'll circle back to those questions and answer as many as we can uh, with the timeline uh, permitted. So just a little bit of background on, on NCAR. Uh, NCAR is a federally funded research and development center of the National Science Foundation that's administered by a consortium of 120 North American universities through the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, UCAR, which is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization. NCAR conducts and leads the community in research on climate, weather, atmospheric chemistry, geospace science, Earth observation systems, and we're also an NSF supercomputing center. So we're gonna cover several topics today, um, including the use of remote sensing in atmospheric science research and weather prediction operations, sensing systems that utilize the radio frequency spectrum, impacts of interference on earth sensing and weather research and prediction, and current and recent education and outreach activities to the spectrum management community and policymakers, in which there's been quite a lot of activity over the last several years. Uh, just a very um, high level briefing on how radio frequency information is used um, to support our system science and, and observations. There's passive remote sensing, uh, for example, water vapor sensing of the atmosphere from satellites. We have active remote sensing, which is an example of being weather radars uh, in vertically pointing wind profilers. Uh, we use RF frequencies and data transmission, uh, the geostationary satellites, the GOES system reception from the data, moving the data from the satellite down to the ground is done via radio frequency, as you'd imagine. We have USGS river gauge data that is also moved through the GOES system. It's uplinked and then downlinked to the ground so it can be distributed to stakeholders. We have atmospheric sounding system, radio sound systems that use radio frequencies. And there's a lot of other examples and our expert speakers are gonna walk through many of those. I did wanna mention that um, the NSF uh, spectrum topic has been a really hot topic in the news lately. There have been uh, a, quite a bit of buzz on it, uh, the controversy around spectrum sharing there have been several reports that have been produced, uh, such as those from uh, the Aerospace Corporation, the World Meteorological Organization, and the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, that really describes the criticality of uh, spectrum for Earth observations and the concerns that we all have about interference as we move towards a 5G world. So the WMO is certainly calling for a, some care in how radio frequencies are allocated. Um, they stated recently that they really don't wish to hamper the rollout of 5G, but they're quite concerned that they should not encroach on the frequencies that are important for Earth observing because that'll impact life-saving applications. So in a sense, as we're trying to move forward, we have to be very careful. So. Um, there's kind of a community charge out there at this point that it kind of states, you know, how can we meet our desire for more wireless bandwidth and not interfere with critical Earth system sensing? 
So we definitely need smarter usage of the spectrum. And one example of a program that is moving forward to, to do just that um, is the NSF Spectrum Innovation Initiative to establish national, the National Center for Wireless Spectrum Research. This is one initiative that I hope uh, this webinar will be informing in terms of the uh, Earth System Science community. So let's uh, move ahead to our speakers. Um, the first speaker will be um, Vivek from NCAR's Earth Observing Laboratory. Thanks, Ms. Payne. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Bill, uh, for a nice introduction and uh, organizing the webinar. Um, my talk mainly focuses on atmospheric remote sensing. Um, describes importance of spectral purity, not having any radio frequency interference to create a best product for the community. In this presentation, um, I would like to show uh, a instruments supported by NSF, which represents the cross section of the instruments what you find in the research community and the operations. So here we have the radars, which are active sensors. There are many frequencies. The radars come from profilers all the way to scanning radars for looking at uh, precipitation, high impact weather, tornadoes, and we have cloud radars, which basically describes about stratocumulus cumulus cloud, which are about 30% of the cloud, a uh, third stratocumulus cumulus cloud for uh, climate and other studies. The wind profilers for forecasting, then also uh, radiometers for measuring temperatures. This is a, a, a cross section of instruments in, in the research realm and also operationals. And so it's important to have a best spectrum, what we could do so that we can get the best products out of this one. So to get there, let's give a brief introduction to a, a 5G. The 5G demands high data rates, also high reliability latency. Why? The applications are augmented reality. Augmented reality is, as you see in a cell phone, is a digital element. For example, in a cell phone, you had a basically a camera, like a FaceTime, is an AR, augmented reality, a virtual reality. These things need very high bandwidth, also reliability in, uh, in the ultra high reliability of the data stream. The applications, if you look at it, you have self-driving cars, automation, even remote surgery. These things will enable as the industry of the future in the 5G wireless technology. Then content of Internet of Things, IOTs, this is coming very common nowadays with the uh, data communication, with the um, latest communication technology, the smart homes, buildings, and smart cities. And these are the key uh, industries of the future with the 5G. That's why there's a huge demand for the spectrum. Okay, the spectrum demand, if you look at it, there are three categories in this case, the leverage, high frequency, the carry frequency is a higher, then we can transmit high data rates. That's why the demanding for a high frequency like 24 to 86 gigahertz, high frequency. At the same time, high frequencies have problem with the uh, communication. It cannot go for long distance, it is a limited distance. In the low bands, like a below one gigahertz are leveraged for spatial coverage. And so there are two requirements, high data rates, same time, better spatial coverage. Then there's a mid bands, one to six gigahertz. That offers both high data rates and also uh, good spatial coverage. It's a Goldilocks. That's a, unfortunately, that's a frequency everyone wants it. One to six gigahertz where there's a good data rate, same time, good coverage. Uh, if you look at the recent uh, news, uh, just about, I think uh, last month, they got about $81 billion for that kind of frequency, 3.7 to 4 gigahertz of a C band where they auctioned off. Lots of money in that, also a lot of need. 
in the, the past uh, year or so, the spectrum uh, allocations, uh, they did about uh, 0.7 gigahertz for uh, below three gigahertz, one gigahertz spectrum for license for higher band bandwidth. Then in the coming in the coming year, they're talking about 23 or 24 gigahertz spectrum to be auctioned off. Then there is a lot of need and there's a good amount of money to be generated. This money would be used for for research and development, also for revitalizing national programs. And it's not just a money uh, uh, getting into that; it's also feed back into a uh, uh, national planning. Okay, this is a busy slide. Shows the top panel shows a spectrum between 450 to 7 gigahertz or so, where you see that I marked up various instrumentation. The bottom uh, row shows uh, 24 to 93 gigahertz. There are instruments in atmospheric remote sensing, spans all this spectrum, the wind profilers. The red, red marks here, if you see my cursor, red marks here, operate in much lower frequency L band. They are in L band wind profilers, basically important for 24 7 wind measurement for a forecasting. Then comes the next RAD, our S pole, there are S band, nationwide radar, the weather service radars, are about 3 gigahertz. That's the next one. Then comes the APAR. APAR is our C band radar. Uh, I'll go to that later. The C band radar. Uh, many of them are out in the uh, uh, community. Um, that's in about uh, in its about uh, five gigahertz uh, bandwidth uh, frequency here. Then, uh, then if you look at uh, K band data, in fact, cloud sensing K band data. That's uh, basically in about thirty five gigahertz. Then comes the a temperature profiler. Um, it's a radiometer. Uh, it's an oxygen bands. That's for sensing uh, temperature profile and atmosphere. Just a passive instruments, very broad bandwidth. Then we have a 93 gigahertz radar for the cloud sensing. In this curve, what it shows is here is uh, the green um, uh, color represents the spectrum to be auctioned in the future. There are shared, shared spectrum. Then also red shows unlicensed spectrum. Then there are yellow color under study, how they want to manage those things. Then the satellite, four satellites, the blue colors. Well, this is a very busy uh, uh, slide, but basically it describes the remote sensor for atmospheric sensing spans the whole range of uh, spectrum here, starting from the L-band up to 90 gigahertz. And it's important uh, uh, to understand that our spectral purity is important for all of them like that. Okay, what is signal strength? Uh, in the case of uh, sensing atmosphere, um, raindrops, now based look at it, they're about one to five millimeter, that's sparsely spaced. Uh, the radar transmits megawatt of power, but they receive a picowatt of power. That's a very big difference between what we transmit, what we receive. The power received is picowatt or even tenth of a picowatt. Compared to the cell signal, cell phone signals are about one picowatt. And so on it ends there, each if you can interfere with the weather radars, when the interferes, then radar signal will clobber. And that's the problem with that. And so the cell phone signal is 10 times stronger than the lowest weather radar signal. That should take into account. That's why we need a pure spectrum for remote sensing atmosphere. This is an example. This is the only example I'm going to show where using uh, a RFI uh, sensor filter. In this case, the radar uses a filter trying to suppress radar uh, radio frequency interference. The panel on the left shows due to the filter, basically we got a gap in the measurements. The right panel shows without the filter. Hence, they have a filter to reduce RFI, but unfortunately, it took out the needed good desired data. And so that is a problem. Currently, what we have is a low-tech version of filter which basically wipes out a good data set, and it is difficult to use the data set at this point. Okay, this is basically a, a, so far what I went through with an introduction. Now, I will go through a, 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 a series of instruments supported by NSF and also in the community, what we use it for. Okay, the wind profiler. Wind profilers are in L-band. 
they are about 915 or 449 megahertz. They transmit about less than a kilowatt power. Uh, there are times it can get a higher power. They cross correlate the winds, the measurements. They get the 3D winds, basically the updraft and also the wind direction. Both needs to be done. And this is a very common instrument used for weather forecasting. Here is a measurement from the wind profile here. And the top panel shows uh, the yellow color or, or a cool color shows basically downdrafts. The strong color shows the updrafts. And these are the key measurements shown as a function of time here for about three hours. The function of time, the altitude, the winds are shown here. In the top panels, the updrafts are circled up there and the uh, downdrafts in other colors. The bottom panel shows the wind strength and also direction. These are the key measurement uses for weather forecasting. Next one is uh, a scanning radar. These radars use about three gigahertz uh, frequency, about one megahertz bandwidth, narrow bandwidth. They use of polarimetric signals to look into the storm, high impact weather for measuring uh, rain rate or uh, cloud physics. And these are very common radars, uh, weather radars, Next slide, the similar thing, the same frequency, same kind of bandwidth. What do they do? They look at the clouds, thunderstorms, or winter snowstorms, come up with the measurements like that. This figure shows a typical measurement from a weather radar, a cross section. The left panel shows the altitude, up to 20 kilometer altitude. This is about 80 kilometer, a cross section. Shows a very strong return from a, a thunderstorm. The right panel shows the scientific product, what we get from this radar. It shows automatically it picks up the hail, the heavy rain, and the grapple and the snow. And these are very important for, a, uh, for a forecasting, also warning the public about the impending uh, high impact weather. And these are the observations routinely collected by weather radars and uh, uh, shared with the, the community uh, in the public for, uh, for, for, for basically the high impact weather and also in, in the winter time, the snowfalls. And uh, these are the key measurements currently we're using uh, basically a three gigahertz uh, spectrum for this. This is a C-band radar, um, slightly different than what you're talking about. This is a radar which is much wider bandwidth, about 20 megahertz compared to one megahertz bandwidth, but operates at C band five gigahertz. Um, these radars are going to be the future of both for ground airborne sensing. Why, what I'm showing here is airborne sensing radar, where we have a four radars, they're all transistor radars. These radars are about five gigahertz, 2000 transistors in this one, each panel. It has a four radars, two sides of the radar, one on the top, one on the cargo door. The, all these radars will operate a slightly different frequency. This type of radar requires a lot more bandwidth and also very clear spectrum so that we can get the best measurements. The measurements, what we get from this radar looks like that. For example, here, this shows basically eye wall in a, a, a rain bands in a hurricane, 200, uh, 200 by 200 kilometer, shows the airplane tracks here, you see the rain bands here. These are measured like that in real time and transmitted. And uh, this was measured by a, 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 a radar, what we had, the X-band radar, Heldora radar before. And these are kind of measurements we tend to get from the, uh, the uh, C-band radars, what we plan to uh, design in the coming years. And uh, the difference between these two radars are the X-band is a 10 gigahertz, what we're aiming for the C-band the five gigahertz. And that these are important in terms of how good you can do measurements of the uh, storms. The next one is a, a cloud radar. This is a radar mounted in an airplane, like cloud stream in this case, in the part, as you see my uh, cursor here, the 95 gigahertz radar. This is a quite important to distinguish the terms of uh, uh, cloud radars. The cloud eyes, this is a measurement on the, on the top panel shows, I'm sorry, Go back here. Okay, on the top, 
we have a slide shows the measurements and the bigger slide shows the product. It shows aerosol, ice crystals, super cool liquid, and the drizzle and the cloud liquid. These are the products we get out of the cloud radars. The topmost panel shows the product in the LIDAR. LIDAR doesn't show that much. You can see a lot of things are absent in the LIDAR panel, the topmost, but the radar sees much more. Radar was operating at 90 gigahertz. It shows much more detailed picture of uh, the clouds. Basically shows the rain and the drizzle and the super purple cool liquid. This is quite important by aviation weather. Super cool liquid like that, the purple color, what we should the magenta color, that's the here, the aerosols. And the, these are the scientific products routinely used for weather, various applications in a DOE and the other agencies. We did it for a, a field deployments here. And these products are used validating the weather forecasting models or the climate models. Um, the last one in the instrument uh, column is a temperature profiler. This uses a very broad bandwidth, uh, more than about two gigahertz bandwidth in this case, uh, compared to megahertz bandwidth, so gigahertz bandwidth. Um, this is on an airborne platform uh, built by uh, JPL. Shows the temperature profile as a function of height, as a function of the time here in this case, at, at that type traverses. And uh, this beam is about 90, about seven degree beam it gives the precise measurements of temperature for locating a troposphere height. And, uh, and, and also temperature in the cloud and the, the clear air conditions. Uh, that's basically a, a summary of uh, research instrumentation or the operation instrumentation of how they produce the scientific products. In summary, the cell phone signal strength is much stronger than a radar signal. Hence, <laughs> it, it will interfere unless we smartly manage the spectrum. The RFI filter to minimize the signal interference currently put the undesired artifact. That means it wipes out real good signal. As I discussed, as we showed in this presentation, we need a range of instruments, all the way from L band up to uh, 90 gigahertz to sensing atmosphere so that we can produce scientific products which are in need for uh, research and also operation use. These radars use uh, uh, sometimes narrow bandwidth, one megahertz. But the future radars, which are phased array radars, which are solid state radars, use a much wider bandwidth, 20 megahertz, even 30 megahertz bandwidth, and they're much broader because they transmit lower power. You need to use a pulse compression that needs a much broader bandwidth. Hence, you see broader signals, broader band signals in the future. Then uh, some of you know about the last bullet, what I mentioned about the sensor tech sensor project where they want to. Uh, basically uh, make use of the uh, spectrum efficiently. At the same time, they want to uh, come up with a new technology for sensing atmosphere using a phased radar or solid state radars. And spectrum efficient uh, uh, project basically says, we can get the money from uh, the spectrum uh, auctioning out, use the, measure, use the money to support R&D and also national radar infrastructure. With this, I would stop. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for that great introduction of how NCAR and the community uses radio frequency spectrum for Earth observations. So let's switch over to um, our next speaker, uh, Jordan Gerth, um, who I mentioned is from the National Weather Service Office of Observations. All right. Thank you and hello, everybody. Glad to be with you today. Hope everybody's staying well. Uh, I'm also the chair of the American Meteorological Society Committee on Radio Frequency Allocations, and I'm glad to have a couple committee members here. And uh, following Vivek, he provided a very good perspective of where we are with the radar. And I'm gonna touch a little bit about where we are with uh, NEXRAD and interference uh, coming up here. Following that, I'm gonna talk about uh, a number of satellite issues that we have with satellite remote sensing. Uh, if you're looking to get in touch with our committee, uh, our, our web address is there, and of course my email uh, or and Twitter accounts are there as well. You know, we realize in, in the AMS uh, and the Weather Service that uh, members of the enterprise have a variety of spectrum needs, both for communications and for observations. 
And spectrum use is ubiquitous in our enterprise, regardless of whether you're in academia, government, and industry. So I think this NSF initiative really provides us an opportunity to figure out how we are going to uh, operate in this new world order of so many connected devices and a really increasing need for high resolution observations as well. Challenges are inevitable and, and the costs are growing. It, it's really no different than living in, in the downtown major US city. You have noisy neighbors, property values are increasing. A lot of people have different things going on kind of seemingly all right on top of each other. So thinking about what we can do in terms of research in this area to really inform the future. I think, you know, I break it down in, into three areas where I think we're somewhat uh, deficient at this time. And the first one is identifying. And we need to know where interference is occurring. Uh, I suspect in the future, we're gonna see more out of band interference. People, uh, operators may not know they're interfering with our systems. Uh, sometimes it's going to be obvious, uh, but it also may not be. And that is where I have some uh, concerns about uh, observations uh, you know, we are assimilating. We certainly don't want to assimilate, for example, satellite observation that we don't know has been influenced by a terrestrial 5G system. And outside of the United States, we have limited options for ultimately changing the background environment of what we are trying to sense. There's a different regulatory environments and our satellites are going to sense uh, everything regardless of whether there's a uh, terrestrial network there or not. The second thing is really exploring. And, and as a scientist, there's a substantial number of important science questions that could be asked. And I think a lot of them could inform the Weather Service and, and NOAA and NASA that are planning these larger observational systems, satellite systems, and also some radar networks. And we need a good indication of the relative value of different observations and how they influence numerical model solutions. That's where a lot of these observations are having the greatest impact now. Uh, in, in model verification, there's been a transition away from the bulk parameters, the 500 hectopascal height scores, and towards specific features and local effects. Do we get the center of the tropical cyclone in the right place, the wind field, uh, the precipitation, whether the rain is, is geographically distributed correctly, and, and the maximum uh, maxim is in the correct place. So there's a lot of work that could be done in this regard to really explain a lot better how our observations are making a specific forecast uh, better. And then lastly, there's a lot of additional engineering and, and perhaps techniques development and image processing that could come into play, possibility of div, uh, digital filters. There's also some uh, potential for sharing spectrum and time and space. I think Dave is gonna talk about bridging the gap between uh, radiometers, instrument designers and telecommunication system developers. So moving very quickly into NEXRAD, this is our, our NEXRAD network. I'd like to thank uh, Christina Harvett at the Radar Operations Center for the next few slides here. We have 159 NEXRAD radars across the country. There's very few other operators of S-band. I think most people are aware of what we use them for, issuing severe weather warnings. We're also trying to assimilate these observations. And we've had about 576 documented requests for assistance due to interference since 1992. And I'm told that we generally have fairly good cooperation when we do uh, have uh, interference that's occurring near some of our sites. And we have approximately 10 to 14 ongoing issues at any time. So it's something that we continually deal with. The sources of interference tend to be the FAA and the DOD air surveillance radar. Uh, also cell towers are becoming a, an increasing, uh, increasingly large concern uh, in near that uh, uh, 25 to 2600 megahertz range. Other sources are wireless ISPs, radio and television towers, co-channel next rads, and uh, other airborne and maritime radars. So this is an example of what kind of interference we see on next red. Fortunately, on these days, we don't have uh, major weather that's occurring, but you can easily see how if this occurred when we had major weather, that could provide a complication to our warning services. Uh, you'd see that kind of that uh, pattern, outward, radial outward pattern, uh, where there is uh, interference in this case from WiMAX in, in 2014, a uh, predecessor network to the, uh, the five, four and 5G networks that are being rolled out today. 
Um, so just a brief summary to wrap up the radar issues. The next rad receives interference from a variety of, of sources, uh, but mainly the ASRs and cell towers. Good, good mitigation of RFI ultimately starts with, with proactive rulemaking, MTIA and FCC. So there's some opportunity uh, to, to make sure that process works well. And we really need to talk about addressing the sensitivity of the uh, next rad receiver. Um, and if you have any further questions on this, please get in touch with uh, Christina, who's our engineering branch chief, and uh, we can, can direct you in the right direction about what our additional, uh, more specific challenges are. So thank you. So moving on to talk about satellites now, hopefully it's not lost on anyone how many of our observations come from remote sensing, uh, specifically satellites, uh, rain rate, precipitable water, winds, land use, the list goes on and our needs to deliver weather observations are also going to increase. So think about the additional novel and, uh, observations that cars, drones, smartphones are collecting now and, and could be valuable to us. So you see many different data sets here. It looks like it might be a little choppy on the uh, animation, but um, all kinds of data is not only being used uh, to, to build climatologies, but also in terms of uh, you know, assimilating it into, into models. So this is a, a brief summary of some of the spectrum matters for the weather enterprise. I'm not gonna get be able to get too deep uh, with the limited time that we have here, but the major one is this L-band issue that we started with as far as the transmission of weather observations, not so much collecting the observations, but with GOES-R and, and before it, the GOES satellite, operational satellites, we have a lot of concern about getting the data back down from these satellites. It needs to be consistent and reliable. And there's also concerns about a, a GPS, which I believe Renee will talk about a little bit later. And I'll just talk very, show an example very briefly of what, what interference used to look like uh, with the previous generation of GOES. Uh, and oftentimes when we started to see this, it was perhaps an unexpected source that could be eliminated easily like a lawnmower at the acquisition station. That was actually one of the issues that we had. But as wireless networks are being deployed, we're seeing this occur more and more and uh, it's harder and harder to trace down. In the new generation, this is an example of GOES-16 with some lost data. And this, the great capability of GOES-16-17 is the ability to have uh, 30 second or one minute imagery. And we have algorithms that are running the data and operational decisions that have to be made on very short time scales, very similar to radar. So it's certainly not ideal when we have a slab of data missing as thunderstorms are developing uh, as shown in this example from August of 2019. Away from the communication issue of, of bringing satellite data back down from the satellite, it's also the sensing aspect. And Dave Lubar is gonna talk a little bit more about this, but I just wanted to give a very brief overview of all of the passive microwave bands that are being used uh, to, to inform weather forecasts. And these are among the biggest contributors to our global numerical weather prediction skill, particularly in the uh, 50 to 60 gigahertz range uh, for the uh, temperature profiling and also up around 90 gigahertz where we have uh, imagery of uh, tropical cyclones that informs uh, warning decisions there. There are ongoing concerns specifically on the uh, lower half of this table. Vivek talked uh, about uh, C-band, so I'm not gonna touch any more about that, but we used to have a NOAA port service there. More on the topic of, of passive remote sensing though, you know, K-band was a very hot potato issue this year. Uh, you saw Bill's presentation, the spectrum wars. That was a water vapor sensing that we have on ATMS, an operational satellite. NOAA is continuing to work through that. There's also another docket that the AMS filed in about the W band, the 86 to 92 gigahertz, which I just said was something that we were using for tropical cyclones. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is nothing new, the interference that we're seeing. And uh, if you look here, this is an example from uh, AMSRE, and we still see the signals in the 6.9 gigahertz. It's AMSR 2, uh, where there's cities. We see how the, those uh, terrestrial networks are affecting our uh, satellite signals. So this is something we're going to have to deal with. It's already there. Uh, we just don't want it to happen anymore in, in our more critical bands. 
And the other thing that's important to realize is, you know, 20 years ago, we weren't really leveraging the value of the water vapor bands as much as perhaps uh, we are now and, and we, we found value for. 2006, 6% uh, in the FSOI compared to 20% uh, in 2016. And over the oceans, uh, it's 25 to 45%. So some areas are really, re for, for global modeling, we really are relying heavily on uh, what microwave water vapor observations on, in some parts of the globe to inform our numerical skill based on the uh, ECMWF. So just to summarize the satellite interference impacts, uh, the data, the delivery of satellite data must be timely, consistent, and reliable. This is one thing that and we just try to emphasize that as much as we can, and we should uh, devise solutions that really deliver that because we never know uh, at this point uh, when we're going to need to heavily rely on those observations. And so we should uh, come to the table assuming that they're all critical and then and work from that starting point. And the value of water vapor observations is not easily achievable through other means. The global scale that is, is of these observations is exactly why we launched the satellites in the first place. We want a very even analysis of the same observations across the entire globe, updated at least twice daily and oftentimes more with the multiple satellites to really show us how uh, the weather is moving. And geostationary infrared's not enough. These uh, satellites are, are a bit like a CAT scan, the microwave, passive microwave bands. And then continuing important observing capabilities maintains the value uh, of our satellite constellations and quality of our local and global weather forecasts. A lot of times it is about maintaining a baseline for skill. And you know, we can take an observation system out temporarily. For example, we saw the aircraft data decrease uh, this spring. Generally, the models performed okay with that loss. But if you take two systems out, you continue to degrade it, all of a sudden your skill floor decreases. Some, some forecasts are all right, others are, are degraded. So with that, I'll conclude. The spectrum issues keep coming, and as an enterprise, we must be aware of the value of our spectrum holdings in dollars and cents and how it uh, helps us deliver better forecasts to the American public. I think that's something that uh, this NSF initiative can embrace. The speed of science and peer review is slower than current spectrum auctions. Vivek talked about it, $81 billion. That is a lot at stake. And so we need to incorporate an element of anticipation more demand for passive microwaves appears in the future and the NSF provides an opportunity to better develop expertise about our wireless challenges in the sciences. So thank you for your time and I look forward to the other panelists and uh, questions you may have at the uh, end of this session. So thank you Thanks. and uh, onward. Thank you, Jordan. It was a fantastic talk. And yes, we are relying more and more on these data sets for earth system science research and weather prediction. So. We definitely don't want to lose it. All right, our next speaker, uh, David Lubar with the uh, Aerospace Corporation. David, you're up. All right, thank you, Bill. Let me uh, bring this to full screen. Um, I, as Bill said, I'm David Lubar. I'm from the Aerospace Corporation, and I'm an engineer who specializes in spectrum management for meteorological satellites. Now, Dr. Gerth has discussed several areas, including products and services from space-based systems. I'd like to focus on some specific topics associated with passive remote sensing and the communication or dissemination of meteorological and hydrological data via space. And I will encompass the two high topics I think that he had on his chart. So on this slide, it's a little busy. Let's look back to 2019 and the bands that were considered for commercial broadband use between 20 and 100 gigahertz. Um, this is about the bands that Vivek introduced called high band. And of those five band candidates that were studied worldwide for international use uh, in the millimeter range region, only two were selected that were close to passive bands. And those are the ones marked in red um, near the 23.8 to 24 gigahertz band and the 36 to 37 gigahertz passive bands. Now, none of us really know for certain what other bands may be selected in the future after the current batch of lower frequencies that just sold, for example, informally called mid-band, 
are consumed by the virtually endless commercial appetite for bandwidth. So all the other little blocks on here, I'm not going to touch on, but I want you to know that you know those are all services sharing, if you will. So how does a terrestrial service create interference to a passive instrument flying overhead in space? The 5G infrastructure may utilize radio frequency beam forming to direct a matrix of signals so that they may communicate with handsets and other user devices. That signal may bounce off buildings or the terrain or the ground such that some portion will move in an upward direction. So contamination of the science measurements can be the result if enough of this signal upwells from the densely installed 5G infrastructure. If this occurs, there's no method to separate the unwanted contamination from the desired measurements. And a low level of contamination might be near impossible to detect that simp simply corrupts the data. And so the solution to that is you have to discard it. Um, besides 5G, there are satellite uplinks for moving satellites that are non directly adjacent to both ends of the 50.2 to 50.4 vertical temperature passive band. So if those signals have some out of band emissions and those, those out of band emissions fall within the passive bands, could they also create contamination? Well, I'll add a disclaimer. I've not participated in any analysis of these satellite systems and I simply don't know the answer to that. But as transmit ground antennas track moving satellites, they're already pointed up and they are creating an ever-changing geometry as passive sensors fly overhead. So let's talk a little bit about it. I think this is the misunderstood part um, between communication engineers. These two uses that we've been talking about um, are radically different. And if that's a fact that may not be apparent to most communication engineers. Why? Because a passive sensor is measuring minute differences of the level of the noise floor that you see in the bottom of this picture. It's perhaps on the order of tenths of Kelvin. A communication engineer is interested in the information content of a signal riding above the noise floor. Any effects at or below the noise floor for a communication engineer do not usually impact the extraction of the information content and are often not a factor in their design. And their out of bound emissions might be you know, on the order of tens or perhaps even hundreds of Kelvin, you can easily see how that would swamp the minute measurements that are being made by the passive sensor. So I present these slides to compare and contrast 5G systems versus satellite uplinks near 50 gigahertz. And as I said, with the 5G high band systems, this will involve hundreds or thousands of towers and small cells located primarily in urban areas. Again, those sources today are near 24 gigahertz and 37 gigahertz passive bands. But tomorrow, who knows what future bands may be considered. The satellite uplinks adjacent to 50 gigahertz and the vertical temperature passive band, which is a key input to numerical weather prediction, are another source whose adjacent signals are intentionally pointed upward. And as I said before in the last slide, we've not analyzed to see if these systems may have an out-of-band interference level that could contaminate the passive band. But the question is, which type of system could be more impactful to a passive sensing instrument flying overhead in space? The combined contribution to all potential sources contributes to this total interference, which may be received. I think in general, very few people appreciate that these passive sensing satellites are nothing more than an extremely sensitive power meter um, actually incredibly insensitive as they overfly the planet. So what are the kind of questions and things that perhaps the scientific community, um, wait a minute, I don't think that's the right slide. Yeah, let's do it this way. Uh, it's important that the scientific community follow the proposed new uses near bands where passive sensing is performed. On this slide, I ask four questions directed at the user community. Will either 5G or satellite uplinks directly adjacent to passive bands impact the nearby science measurements? What are the ramifications of such contamination if commercial systems create such RF interference? Does the scientific community think the regulatory restriction on adjacent band interference imposed on these users are adequate to eliminate contamination of data? And lastly, 
What measures are needed by users of passive data if this contamination is determined to exist? As I said, I would talk a little bit about one of the other topics that Jordan flagged on his charts. So besides passive contamination, radio frequency interference can impact communications or information dissemination systems of weather data. This slide shows the downlinks in the L band or 1.6 gigahertz range from GOES. Um, on the left, you see the data collection system. In the middle, you see the product rebroadcast called GRB or GOES rebroadcast. And then you have other relay services as well associated with the satellite. On either side, you see at the top, the frequency spectrum, there you have either long-term evolution, i.e. 4G type um, cell phone, or you see proposals to share spectrum with commercial services. Let's see here. So let's just use one example. Um, the data collection system, uh, which was mentioned briefly, um, interference from proposed or adjacent or actually even in-band sharing by commercial systems can impact the relay or acquisition of data from water and wildfire weather sensors used for flood prediction, maritime navigation, dam, reservoir safety, and the management of wildfires that protect the lives of firefighters. This is original data that if it encounters interference, it's lost and not recoverable. So as you see, you know, there are thousands upon thousands of these sensors, approximately 40,000 in the hemisphere, uplinking at one frequency, and it uses the GOES weather satellite essentially as a communications relay coming back into federal and non-federal stations for this information. So a current example of data carried over DCS are the gauges used for water and debris flow in the California burn areas that are currently having uh, issues with mud flow. And they're now impacted by that rainfall that's caused by atmospheric rivers. And I might also point out that the original predictions for those atmospheric rivers utilize some of the passive microwave measurements of total water content at the 238 gigahertz passive band. So this concludes my portion and I thank you and we'll hand it back to Bill. Thank you, David, for that very informative presentation. Um, our last speaker is Rene Leduc from Narayan Strategies. And Rene has been very active for several years now in working with stakeholders and policymakers to try to communicate um, our science and, and what the impacts might be of interference. So it's all yours, Renee. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, just wanted to make sure that you all can hear me. Just trying to get my slides shared here. Okay, great. And so, um, all right. So, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I run a company called Nodayan Strategy based, based in the Washington DC metro area that focuses on climate, weather, and aerospace policy. I would say that um, a great deal of time over my past few years has really focused on uh, specifically spectrum and how it relates to really the weather enterprise or basically the public, private, and academic stakeholders that make up all, all of really the weather community and really um, 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 provides all of those weather forecasts that all of us rely on predominantly through our wireless devices. And so, and so I'm here today to talk a little bit more about really the policy pieces of uh, policy, policy pieces of all of these discussions. And I should note highly technical discussions. And so, and so really, really, I have been in the midst of, of really dealing with the policy and politics of spectrum 5G and weather forecasts. And so why do observations matter? I sort of want to take it back up to the 50,000 foot level after really getting into more of the details with each of the previous speakers and, and really, and really say, why do, why do weather related observations matter? Why do environmental observations matter? It, it really has to do with, you know, um, when, when we're focused on weather observations, we're really focused on saving lives and property from basically a range of really environmental hazards. And, and, and however, though, I would say that these images really show a variety of uses. Um, 
certainly leading from sort of drought, drought and basically wildfires, um, certainly different temporal resolution in terms of being able to predict those things, floods, 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 as well as tsunamis, um, as well as information that can then inform um, understanding of basically uh, threat of vector-based diseases, and then and then right in the and then right in the center top, that is basically a large container ship which happened to get grounded, uh, largely because they didn't have right information about how much water was inside of the channel. Though that type of information is actually relayed by all of the system that David Lubar was just talking about all. All of, all of the DCS or data collection system. And when a, and, and, and there are huge economic impacts when basically a container ship of that size happens to get grounded. And it certainly impacts a lot of the shipments that we all rely on and, and really keeping things moving forward. But it really then comes down to the question of how valuable are these services? What is the value of these observations and and what's the value of reliable forecasts that people can that people trust and that people take specific action on largely to minimize all of their risk and so how do and so what does this have to do with spectrum well when we're looking at the policy issues around around spectrum and really the competing uses specifically for a a set amount of spectrum, we really need to take a look at what are those, um, what are those comparable values of sort of um, um, 5G versus having reliable weather forecasts. And basically, and, and most of all, how can we create a situation where, where both are valued and both can coexist? Because right now I'm very concerned that they can't coexist, largely because I believe that not enough research has actually been done to re uh, research research R and D innovation work to really find ways for these different technologies to really coexist in a way that minimizes risk to weather forecasts, but then also minimizes risk of sort of downtime of of our whole variety of wireless devices. And so, but, but oftentimes inside of these policy processes, these, these, these questions behind these conflicts between 5G transmissions and, and really weather, weather forecasting observations, oftentimes technically we get down to very technical matters of things like assessing noise floors and how this certain observation is impacted by this certain operation. But at the policy level, we're not talking about those details. We are really talking about the inherent values of really these things. And very importantly, taking a look at the various different studies which basically undergird all of these discussions. And so that's why I'm really pleased that we're having all of, all of this all of this time together, specifically given that NSF is taking such important steps in terms of really looking at what spectrum innovation is most required right now in light of these types of conflicts and knowing that it's not only the weather community that is experiencing these conflicts. And so, and so as you have probably seen in the news, particularly back in 2019, as well as in 2020, there were a number of headlines out there sort of sort of talking about this inherent conflict. And so um, and so and, and basically really, really looking at sort of sort of what's the value of weather, as well as its diverse needs for a range of different types of spectrum assets and how to balance that with the benefits of deploying 5G quickly, both certainly the benefits of 5G um, um, but then also the economic and strategic benefits associated with quote unquote beating China at 5G. And so and so and and so those to our, those sorts of political arguments are very powerful at senior levels of really the federal government as well as in senior levels in Congress. However, though, 
oftentimes inside of these debates, really the weather enterprise just is sort of chugging in the background, you know, creating all of our forecasts and not necessarily engaged inside of these debates. And sometimes the only voice inside of the echo chamber that sometimes exists in the fair city that I live in um, really gets so focused on 5G that everything else kind of gets lost. And so let, let me make very clear that the weather enterprise wants 5G. I mean, weather apps are really amongst some of the most used apps in the world, um, but not if it sacrifices the quality of information inside of that app. And, and so, and, and basically, of course, the devil exists inside of the details. And so, and so one, one, um, one example, which was discussed slightly earlier, um, was really talking about all of the example of 23.8 gigahertz in 2019 and the big conflict that came down to really the wireless companies and really the weather community, which resulted in a number of these headlines. And so as has been mentioned earlier, uh, back in the 2018 and, and, and basically earlier timeframe, there was something called Spectrum Frontiers, which was an effort by basically the FCC specifically to identify spectrum to uh, specifically to be freed up specifically for quick 5G deployment. And, um, and they looked at many areas of spectrum, including some key areas that would impact microwave remote sensing and specifically 23.8 gigahertz. And so, um, however, at the time that Spectrum Frontiers came out, they were identifying such a large array of spectrum. And to tell you the truth, the weather community at that time was not tracking these issues super closely. Frequently, the realm of FCC public comments is really the realm of regulatory lawyers and really the wireless community. And um, I should say, though, that colleagues like David Lubar most definitely were looking at this at this at this topic at the time. Um, However, though, there just wasn't enough focus on it more broadly inside of our community. However, in early 2019, FCC decided to move forward and auction the area um, right around 23.8 gigahertz, a very short fuse decision. It came as a surprise to NOAA as well as the, as well as the broader weather enterprise and specifically to really the NOAA administrator, Neil Jacobs. And so, um, and, so, and so all of this suddenly bubbled up and next thing we knew that really the Capital Weather Gang at basically the Washington Post was covering this issue as well as a number of other publications. And the Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, as well as NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine at the time, sent a memo to basically FCC Chairman Ajit Pai saying, you need to stop this auction. We got to talk more about this. We really need to figure out what is going on here because this is going to hurt weather forecasting. And right around this time, um, and going on to the next slide here, you see that Congress gets involved. And specifically, um, Neil Jacobs, um, who was basically the NASA administrator at the time, happened to testify in front of Congress and was asked about this topic and said that if there was interference to 23.8 gigahertz, it would send back weather forecasting backwards multiple decades. Now, we could have a whole discussion about, about how accurate all of that statement was. I believe that fundamentally it was accurate and he was making a very important point. However, though, you know, um, it, it, it really sort of increased the temperature in terms of all of this dialogue. A lot more press coverage and letters from, from basically the Senate. We write with a straightforward request. Don't allow wireless companies to operate in a 24 gigahertz band until vital weather forecasting operations are protected. But I step back to, you don't know, but in, in, and so what happened? The auction actually went forward. Chairman um, FCC, Chairman Pai decided we're moving forward with this auction no matter what. We've talked about this issue enough. We are moving forward in advance of basically the World Radio Communications 
um, conference uh, um, uh, um, 19, which basically happened at the end of 2019. And so really, really the world was watching this too. And so what was the fundamental dispute here? A lot of it came down to differing views of how to interpret and whether to trust studies associated with determining what interference is harmful and what is not. And so I share this story in this way to really um, um, share that research matters and has a crucial role in these increasingly political discussions. And not only does the research matter, but the communication of what the research really means. And, and, so, and so recognizing that 24 gigahertz is a little bit inside of our rear view mirror, we're still very focused on it, but we have a number of other bands that are expected to be considered specifically at the next, uh, at, 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 specifically at really the next World Radio Communication Congress in 2023. And so, also, I think that another factor in play here is the fact that the wireless industry has a great deal of resources inside of the Washington DC area to be able to influence these discussions. Um, um, incredibly, like they all have a number of different law firms who specialize in, in specifically outreach to really the FCC on these, on these matters. Whether community really has less resources in that in that way, I think that we have spun up a lot of effort. However, you know, it has taken some time. And so we're now about two years after, and Senator Maria Cantwell inside um inside of a hearing on Tuesday, specifically about the nomination of Gina Raimondo as Secretary of Commerce. Inside of the first two minutes of basically all of her statement, she specifically made a very clear statement about how, how, how she is concerned about how FCC has run run roughshod over over really the concerns of um, specifically of all of the weather community and 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 really the need to really address the concerns of really the weather community. And so, and so I think that that speaks to the fact that really the weather community has come together specifically on this topic. And, and, and one way in which we've done so is we have come together, particularly groups like American Meteorological Society and American Geophysical Union and National Weather Association together with a lot of others, uh, really to write a number of letters specifically from all of the weather enterprise and in partnership with a lot of other types of organizations, whether they're GPS, agriculture, and, and, and basically a number of other organizations specifically to talk to FCC as well as Congress on really our spectrum concerns. And here are just a few of the signatories just at, uh, of one of our recent letters. And, and, note, and note that one of the signatories is certainly UCAR. Um, and, and, so, and, so, and so I think that all of this is really important. And basically, sure, you know, being focused on the science here is really incredibly important, but thinking about how are we communicating about this science and how are we best dealing with how, how we are able to communicate about just how important these topics are and just what the value questions that are in play here. And so, and so that covers it for me, but thank you so much for all of your time today. We really look forward to some great dialogue with you and um, looking forward to your question. Thank you, Renee, that's fantastic. And yes, like you said, we want our cake and eat it too. <laughs> we want 5G and we want, um, we want all the folks in the uh, telecommunications world to stay away from our spectrum. Uh, so we're gonna move into a, we have about 10 minutes. We're gonna try to, um, uh, deal with the Slido questions. And um, Brett, if you can bring those up, uh, we will we will read the ones that have the most votes to start with. And then when we uh, hit the 15 minute mark of, uh, of the hour, then we'll have to stop. So the first question, um, how receptive have policymakers been to the interference concerns raised by the weather community? Now I'll, I'll let uh, Renee take that one. Sure. Um, I would say that it, it depends, you know, I, 
I think that, you know, um, I would say that those, those, those members of Congress who, who have been most engaged over time in, in looking at and providing oversight and funding to especially NOAA's resources, however, certainly NSF and NASA as well, are going to recognize the value and complexity of a diversity of basically observations that are necessary. Now, but the challenge is that um, I think I find that working with, um, I find that working with rurally based policymakers can sometimes be challenging. And the reason why that is, is because there's such a focus on the need for better broadband inside inside of more rural areas around the, around the, around the country. And, and they see more spectrum and, and basically, and those members are hearing from really the wireless community that better rural spectrum equals basically more, uh, uh, better, better rural broadband equals more access to spectrum. And so, and so I would say that that's not the most valid argument but it's the nature of the political argument that really the wireless community has made very effectively. And so, and so in some ways they are, they are essentially saying, look, you know, can't the weather community like figure out to just like, do they really need that observation? You know, how about we just sort of do, you know, why can't we just give them a set of spectrum and they are just happy with that? Because they aren't really talking about just all of the different characteristics of all of the spectrum that we really rely on. And so, and so it really comes down to sort of how can we have a good answer to that and say how our weather forecasts are absolutely critical to life in rural America. Thank you, Renee. Um, the next question um, is kind of aligned with, uh, with some of the things you've been doing, Renee, as well. Recent decisions on 5G are affecting other safety applications too like in surface transportation and a couple of questions down, it talks about the aviation sector. You know, since there are multiple safety impacts, can the weather community work together with other affected communities to better influence policy? So Renee, go ahead and take that one since there is a, sure. there are a lot of different uh, <laughs> industries affected. Certainly. And, and the thing is, is that I would say that the weather industry certainly has, um, especially as it relates to more of the GOES related issues. We've worked closely specifically with both the aviation, agriculture and GPS um, realms. I, I, I think though that where it gets tricky is that sort of everyone has their little most important places and, knows, and, and everyone knows that something's going to need to be sacrificed or something's going to, or or and, and, and so in some ways, you want to make sure that your area isn't sacrificed over some other. And so that's sometimes how groups kind of split apart in some ways. And, and, so, and, so, and so that's where it gets challenging. Also, it gets challenging in that, you know, a lot of the weather community doesn't really have a whole lot of lobbying resources. And, and basically also a number of organizations are are just plain 501c3 organizations and do not have the ability to do specific lobbying or to join coalitions, et cetera. And so, and so that's where things get tricky, where, where basically a great deal of wireless company resources goes towards the necessary lobbying to be able to meet their goals. Yeah, thank you, Renee. And I know if you, if you had time to go through all of the um, industries that have kind of jumped on to this issue, both uh, with the weather enterprise and, and with GPS, you can imagine how broad of an audience you would have there of GPS accuracy is, is affected. Um, it doesn't take long for people to make their concerns known. And we, we're riding on their coattails in some cases and the opposite in some cases as well. Uh, next question, what are NCAR's views on how the National um, Spectrum Innovation Initiative Center can best benefit NCAR and scientific users. Uh, Vivek, I'll throw that to you since you focus mostly on the NCAR research uh, portfolio here in this, in this webinar. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, NCAR is unique. Um, we work with uh, um, engineers and scientists. That's a gap. You know, we discussed in the presentation, there are communication engineers, there are scientists, 
but there is a gap between them. The NCAR is unique in that way. We try to bridge that gap. And that's an uh, important thing to have the kind of uh, communication between those two groups. Then the NCAR leads the remote sensing in the way with the NFL support become the transformative technology. Like I showed uh, the phase error radar, which is the future of technology where broad bandwidth are desired. Hence, there are things existing remote sensing, but the future of technology, how it's going to evolve next year, 10 to 20 years, the NCAR is in forefront of that one. Given those two things, the NCAR could greatly uh, work with, uh, uh, benefit with the uh, uh, initiative uh, issues so that we could come up with uh, not only with the NCAR scientists, that broader university uh, uh, leverage who we work with uh, in day-to-day -day basis. And so we bound to learn quite a bit from this one. So far, the NCAR developed cutting edge research instrumentation, which has been shown to be how useful it is. That gets into uh, operational use after 10 to 15 years. It's where you want to test this, the frequency interference coexisting in the spectrum. Those things all could be done with the NCAR support with the working closely with uh, these initiatives. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, the next one, somewhat related, uh, maybe a little more broadly posed, with all the information presented here about various observations impacted by RFI, what areas of research would be the, of the highest priority for the weather enterprise from the NSF SII proposers? Jordan or uh, David, would you like to entertain that one? I'll start with it and maybe David has some additional thoughts on it. it. There's so many different areas that could be pursued. I think we heard a lot about radar and the, the possibilities to, to mitigate RFI there. I think there was a field experiment in South America that had a lot of uh, interference with radars and certainly there's opportunities to, to benefit the observations we collect in, in research and field experiments. On the operational side, I, I would have to say that the issues that we're seeing now that are of, of highest vulnerability for numerical weather prediction are coming from the satellite side. Uh, the thought of international adoption of standards where there would be 5G terrestrial networks over broad swaths of the earth, that not only the Americas, but also Europe, Asia, Australia, uh, is, is particularly concerning. And I, I think we're very much under-equipped at the current time to uh, address every potential uh, spectrum threat, if you will, uh, in geographically and, and in space and time. So you know, working in that area to determine what can be done on the engineering side for, for more more for more efficient terrestrial communications, and also what options we have to monitor out of band interference and potentially in band interference for shared spectrum to really mitigate its impact on numerical weather prediction in my mind would be key and most helpful. Thank you, Jordan. David, anything to add there? Uh, you're muted. To echo what Jordan said, I think uh, once 5G uh, in the high band region is more predominant and it is potentially ca causing corruption, the research community uh, you know, may be very helpful in determining the nature of that problem. I mean, OSEs and OSEs are very expensive generally for operational weather organizations to perform and it's difficult to kind of take samples and take data out. And, and when you consider that this problem was not something where you stick a sensor in a test chamber and, and, and bombard it with some local signals, you need the satellite on orbit and the atmosphere and the city creating the source or cities creating the source as a part to analyze it. So uh, once some of that data is more readily available, I think the research community could help there. And just explaining the problem is helpful as well. Thank you, David. And just we could, one more question. And David, since you just had the floor, let me throw this last question to you. Can data signals be constructed in such a way that they can be easily identified and subtracted out without affecting the underlying beam returns? I think that question was really uh, asked earlier during Vivek's talk on radar. 
but if I can sort of twist it a little bit to be similar to one of the others that are down here in the queue, uh, someone asked, well, how do we take this information and fix it, basically? How do we back out the interference? And for the case of a passive sensor, you really can't. Um, you're contaminating data such that there may be very low levels of interference that would be very hard to detect that they're there, or they may be very significant levels that you can detect with algorithms. And the solution is you throw the data out because you can't really separate them. The radar case, I'm not expert to really answer that question. Go ahead, Vivek. Yeah, uh, just add to that David's uh, comment here. Uh, the, the satellite signals are not much of, uh, very difficult to do it. As you were saying, the radar, at least we have a diversity. We have a face coding, uh, dual pole and the polarimetric responses like that. There is some possible, but it has looked into it carefully in the research more because uh, everything depends upon how much they are, they, they are isolated from each other because the best face coding separate the signals, but it's not that easy in practice to demonstrate that. Hence, it has to be done research more and prove those concepts. Then there are ways for active signals, but that has to be uh, studied uh, much more uh, detailed in the coming years. Thank you, Vivek. Um, we're out of time. We're going to have to wrap this up. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers again for participating. I also want to thank uh, Brett Betterman, who is the producer behind the scenes for this event, and also Sue Ellen Haupt, who is helping with the Slido question administration. So thank you very much. And to all our participants, um, we'll have to watch the news and, and, and get active in this topic if it's important to you. So let's build some collaborations to solve the problem. Thank you very much.